Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to you all. And welcome. We'd like to, like to welcome everyone here to the Old Westbury Seventh-day Adventist Church. And to those viewing online, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. And for those present here, we, we just say welcome once again. And to our visitors who are amongst our midst, we pray that you will have a special Sabbath with us as well as everyone who is here. Um, and again, thank you. you know, we're, thank you for everyone coming out. Uh, we have a sunny day coming, it seems, uh, with all the rain that we partook of. We're thankful for the rain. It has so many benefits. But uh, we look forward for the sunny days as well. So I hope that everyone partakes of it later on this afternoon. Um, at this time, we have our announcements for this week. Um, our prayer time on Zoom will be held this Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, you'll receive an email with the link to join in. Please let us know to be added to the list uh, so that you may connect with us in sharing testimonies and special prayers. Please join us in person and online for our prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. We will resume our meeting this week where we will be reading through Acts of the Apostles. Our prayer request cards can be found in the church foyer uh, where you can place them in our prayer request box found in the foyer as well. Um, the Bible question and answers presentation will be held this Monday, October 10th at 7.30 p.m. To view, please go to our website at O. Westbury uh, Seven-day Adventist Online and watch live. Again, this is a forum where you can have your questions answered as it pertains to the Word of God. And remember also that the question and answer cards for any requests or questions that you have can also be placed in the prayer request box in the foyer. Uh, today, after church, women's ministry will be meeting, I believe, today, uh, downstairs to discuss plans for Sabbath afternoon Bible study. Thank you, ladies, for that. And please remember our food pantry is held on the first Sunday of the month uh, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. and third Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We always need volunteers, which helps it run smoothly, so please join us if you're available. Uh, please keep in mind, all announcements must be turned in by Wednesday weekly in order to be stated on the upcoming Sabbath announcements. So mine's is kind of short this week. Not a, not, not a lot of announcements, <laughs> however. Please continue to follow us on Facebook, and you can share your link to all our programs being held here at the church. Also, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. We thank you all for joining us today and we, in today's service, and we all pray that you will have a, a blessed Sabbath as it continues. At this time, let us all stand as the service continues. Our loving Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to come here to worship you, to praise you, and to adore you in all that you have done for us this week. We ask, dear Lord, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. May he come, may he fill this place, and may he overflow our hearts with joy today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Open up your hymns to hymn number 12, Joyful, Joyful, We Are Adore Thee.
morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It's time for our tithes and offerings. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We worship God with our tithes and offerings and donations because God loves his church. The church, as the community of believers, was founded by Jesus. He gave himself up for her. He is the head and chief cornerstone of the church, which is his body. And she has the beautiful title of the Bride of the Lord. To her, he gave a special assignment to serve as the pillar and foundation of the truth. Ellen G. White made this affirmative comment about God's church. And feeble and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. In response to God's love for his church, the believers of the early church supported both the local church community and church communities far away. Following a severe famine throughout the Roman Empire, Luke reports the compassionate response of God's church. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. In his writings, the Apostle Paul regularly appeals for the collection of funds for the church, the Lord's people in Jerusalem. Besides that, there is clear evidence of believers supporting with wages those whose work is preaching and teaching. Paul endorses such practice by quoting Jesus, the worker deserves his wages. The early church believers applied the general principle of love and generosity by caring for God's church. The church is not without flaw, it never has been, but it is loved and has a unique purpose this week as we worship with our tithe and regular offerings called promise. We can respond to the call to love and support the ones who Jesus loves. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for establishing the church in the world and our local communities. Please help us emulate the love that you have for the church by cheerfully supporting those who are part of its mission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody. I'm going to tell you a story. One day, there was a boy named Davy, and he lived on a farm. Once there was a boy named Davy, and he lived on a farm. It was a fun farm, and there were lots to do to care for the animals. One day, their parents decided that they were going on a trip. They thought that the children were old enough to take care of themselves. Davy didn't think that was a good idea. Davy thought that Angie would be very bossy, and he would never have much fun but it was not to be. Angie let them do whatever they wanted, go to bed when they wanted, get up what they wanted, eat what they liked whenever they liked, like ice cream and rich chocolate fudge, buttery popcorn and pancakes drizzling with maple syrup. Of course, they did their usual chores, like milking the cows and milking the cows, picking the beans, and feeding the animals, but mostly they just had lots of fun. As the days whizzed by, Angie realized that their parents would be coming home the very next day. She got very bossy again. She ordered the two middle children to go outside and do yard work. She ordered Davy to dust the house from top to bottom. Davy didn't like that. He wanted to do grown-up jobs like the middle children, but Angie wasn't through bossing. In fact, Angie was so busy, she didn't even have time to cook lunch, so they ate cold leftovers. He had more work to do that afternoon. Davy, I need you to polish the shoes and boots. Polishing shoes and boots? 
What a horrible job. It was so messy. Angie decided to dust the parlor. Davy was not allowed to touch anything in the parlor because it, has mom, it had mom's very best things in it and could easily be broken. When Angie was in the parlor, she noticed Davy was not working very hard. She told Davy to hurry up because he had even more things to do. By this time, Davy was so mad that everything bubbled up inside him. Before he knew what was happening, he had thrown a brush full of shoe polish at Angie. It whizzed past her and landed smack in the middle of the wallpaper in the parlor. Davy was so horrified. What would his mother say? He ran and hid to the barn. It was hours before he finally got out and went to bed, but Davy couldn't sleep. The children were so happy when their parents came home the next day, except for Davy. His mother noticed that he was being very quiet, and his mom gave him a spoonful of nasty-tasting medicine. Yuck. He was even more horrified when he heard that the Johnsons were coming ac from across town and when he heard his mother invite him into the parlor. He expected to hear his mother scream, but instead what he heard surprised him. What? What did I just hear? My, what a beautiful parlor this is. Davy couldn't believe his ears. He went and peeked through the doorway to see what had happened. His mom caught him peeping into the room and invited him to come and sit. He sat in a slippery chair, staring at the wall for quite some time. After tea and cakes, David, Davy lingered in the parlor so he would be the last one to leave. He noticed that someone had cut a piece of wallpaper to fit perfectly over the nasty mess. It was sanded down very thin so it wouldn't be a bump where the wallpaper was added. After supper, Davy found Angie. He gave her a great big enormous hug. Thank you, he whispered in her ear. I'm sorry I threw the brush at you and made that awful mess. You fixed it, didn't you? Yes, I found some wallpaper in the attic and I cut it all out, smoothed the edges, and stuck it on with flour paste. I'm sorry too. It was mostly my fault. I shouldn't have been so bossy. No wonder you felt like throwing something at me. And Davy never ever forgot how special it was to discover that someone loves you enough to cover your mistakes and to save you from the consequences you deserve. It reminds me of a verse, Hebrews 4, 7. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Sounds like someone we know well, right? Yes. Jesus loves us enough to cover our mistakes with his perfect life. He saves us from death we deserve because of our sin and gave us another chance to have the best life possible, now and forever. Isn't that great? Go back to your seats, please. Happy Sabbath again, everybody. It's time for our scripture reading. Today's reading is John chapter 15, verses 9 to 11. That's John 15, 9 to 11. And it reads, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning. 
Happy Sabbath Church family. It's nice to see some new faces at church today. I think it's because of our last week's sermon. Um, waiting to see more. Uh, today's Sabbath is awesome. God tells us, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be discouraged, for I am your God. I will help you, I will strengthen you, and I'll hold you with my victorious right hand. Wonderful promise given to us from Isaiah 41.10. Let's hold on to it. If you have a special prayer today that you want to place into God's feet, kindly raise your right hand up. Thank you. Let's all kneel down and pray if we can, and I will lead in prayer after the prayer song. Dear loving Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, as one family, seeking your blessings and bringing our prayers at your feet, O oh Lord. At this moment, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. You gave us another Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, for that. You brought us together here. We thank you, Lord, for that. We praise you, Lord every moment of our lives, Lord, for what you have done for us. Dear Lord, at this time, I place the church into your hands, O oh Father. Each and every person who is present here, Lord, is your child, Lord. O oh Lord, I also place everyone who is watching us online and joining us this Sabbath, Lord, into your hands. Be with each and every one of, every one of us, Lord. Guide us and lead us and protect us, Lord, from all harm and danger. There is a prayer in every heart here, Lord. Look upon that, Lord, and let your will be done, Lord. Lord, despite our shortcomings, you've been with us and guided us, guided us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that. Give us the grace that we need, Lord, each and every moment of our lives so that we may continue to walk in your path no matter what, Lord. At this time, Lord, I also place the leaders of this church into your hands. Guide them, Lord, and be with them as they lead the church according to your will, O Lord. Give us a heavenly wisdom and knowledge, Lord, to make the right decisions through your word, Lord. Also, Lord, I place the ones who are sick and the ones who are in pain and the ones who are heartbroken into your hands, O oh Lord. Each of us have something going on in our lives, Lord, and you, you're not, it's not hidden from your sight, O oh Lord. So I place that into your hands too, Lord. According to your will and your, in your own time, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to take care of it so that Everyone could glorify your name, no matter what the circumstances and the situation, Lord. Let your garden angels protect us from all harm and danger, Lord. I place the youth of this church into your hands, Lord. Be the ones who are in college and be the ones who are contemplating what field to get into, Lord. Give them the wisdom that they need, Lord, and guide them in their decisions, Lord. I pray for the children who are in the schools. Be their studies and guide them as they study, Lord. Protect the parents as they lead the kids in your way, Lord. Oh Lord, despite Satan's temptations and things that he put us through, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to hold on to our hands so that we may be able to withstand Satan's temptations and things that he brings our way, Lord. Without you and without your presence, we are nothing, oh Lord. So I ask you, Lord, to guide us. I also pray for the prayer warriors of this church, Lord. You know, Lord, 
They're keeping the church and the church members in their prayers every moment, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to guide them, be with their families. Let your presence be with them as they place the prayers of the church into your hands, O oh Father. Also, Lord, I pray for the ones who are, vis who are visiting us today. Guide them, Lord, and be with them. And let their, whatever they're going through in their lives, Lord, be taken care, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for bringing more people to our church, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for making us to be a shining light in this community, Lord. Continue to protect us and give us the right mind and the thoughts so that we may be a light to the ones that we meet and around us. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, no matter where we are and no matter who we meet, O oh Father. I pray for this world and the things that are going there on it, Lord. We have no control over it, Lord, but nothing is hidden from your sight, O oh Lord. So I ask you, Lord, to look upon each and every person in this world through what they're going through, Lord. And if possible, Lord, if given the opportunity and we can make a difference, let us do it, Lord. I also pray for the speaker of the hour. Be with him, Lord, as he brings us his word. Let it be a blessing to each and every one of us here, Lord. We thank you again, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We ask all this in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. This song is just to remind us that regardless of our brokenness, God always picks up the pieces and he puts us back together again. And because of that, we are vessels of honor. I trust that this song will bless your heart today. Emptied and broken, I came back to him, a vessel unworthy, so scarred with sin, but he did not despair, he started clay away and over and over he molds me and makes me into his likeness he fashions the clay a vessel of honor When I stumble and I fall and my vessel breaks, he just picks up the pieces. He doesn't throw the clay away. And over and over, he molds me and makes me to his likeness he fashioned 
once the clay, a vessel of honor. I am today, all because Jesus didn't throw the clay away. A vessel of honor, I am today, all because Jesus. Amen. Thank you again, Lakeisha, for that music ministry. That was blessing. That was a blessing. Where would we be if God threw us away, right? Thank God that for his grace and for his mercy. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Is it truly a happy Sabbath? Are you happy to be here? Do you have joy in your hearts? I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be a member of this church for so many years and have this opportunity to speak to you and to speak to you from my heart. Oftentimes, as I do, when I look for a sermon topic, I try to preach to myself because I know I need some help in some things too. So me like you, uh, the sermon is for all of us. Amen? Amen. The pastor's away at a uh, conference this weekend, so he asked me to cover the pulpit for this Sabbath. The topic is the topic of joy, and I think it's one of the most important things us as Christians are lacking, to be quite honest, in 2022. It's hard to keep joy in our hearts, and we oftentimes try to manufacture it or fake it, so to speak. But the sermon for today, as I open up from God's word and as I've done the research and, and prayed and God has placed this message on my heart, I pray that he will bring it forth from these mortal lips. Bow your heads with me as I pray. Our loving Father, I thank you for this opportunity to bring forth the word. Lord, you have placed it on my heart. Now bring it forth from these lips that each and every person here, whether they are tuned in on live stream or here present today, I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would bring the message home, that the Holy Spirit will do his job, convict us of sin, Lord, and help us to be more like you. We pray, Father, that all that is said and done here will be for your honor and glory, and that the name of Jesus will be lifted up, and everyone in the church will say, Amen. The fullness of joy. You talk about it, you think about it in the Bible, and you see um, that it's there, and you oftentimes wonder, like, what does it mean to have the fullness of joy? And so many times, in so many ways, the Bible speaks of joy as something that we oftentimes misinterpret, I mean, we misunderstand, because we confuse joy and happiness, or well, what's the difference between joy and happiness? What's the fullness of joy? How can I obtain more joy in my life? These are some of the topics I'm going to discuss today in this sermon. Did you greet one another today? Why don't you greet one another today? Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. neighbor. Come on, say it with attitude. Neighbor. neighbor. Jesus loves you. Jesus. And there's nothing you can do about it. Turn to your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Did you feel your face smile? Don't you feel better now? Sometimes your joy is the source of your smile, but sometimes your smile can be the source of your joy. It takes 72 muscles 
to make a frown, but it only takes 14 to make a smile. Now, I'm guilty of this because sometimes we as Christians, and especially on the Sabbath, we come to church on Sabbath, we open our eyelids, we get ourselves ready, we come to this church, we drive here in a car, most of us, we walk into the front doors of a church. Now, I counted probably 20 blessings right there in just that statement alone that we should be joyful about. Did you hear what I'm saying? You woke up this morning. You walked into this church, a building where you can worship the Lord freely without persecution, where you have air conditioning, you have nice cushy seats, you got that handsome and beautiful person sitting right next to you. Not everyone has that. Saying it like it is. <laughs> if you stood up here, you'd know what I mean. You did, some of you, y'all, y'all, y'all beautiful. Y'all, y'all some good looking people. The fullness of joy. What is the fullness of joy? What does joy, this word joy, mean? So if we go into the Greek, right, and say this word with me. Hara. I'm going to say it like you're about to spit something up. Hara. That's the Greek word joy. What does it mean? The emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Keen pleasure or elation. Now, when you study this word in the original Greek, because we, we oftentimes we confuse happiness with joy, right? Now, happiness, um, I may decide, okay, well, today the weather was, you know, it started off kind of rainy, kind of gloomy, and I kind of like, didn't like it. I'm like, oh man, not that many people are going to be in church today. <laughs> They're probably going to stay home in their beds. And then my happiness can, can kind of wane away, right? But then I think about what joy brings to me when I think of Jesus and his sacrifice, when I think of the plan of redemption, when I think of justification by faith, that brings me joy. Now that stuff can't be taken away from me, but my happiness can be taken away from me. The Greek translation of chara is derived from the Greek word charis, which is the Greek word for grace. It's important to note for this because it tells us that chara is produced by the charis of God. This means joy is not a human-based happiness that comes and goes. Rather, true joy is divine in origin. It is spirit-given expression that flourishes the best in hard times. I oftentimes think of it, and I, now when I, when I think about this, and I want to try to get this message across to you when we're thinking about joy, that joy that comes from within, that joy that is spirit-given, it comes from deep inside you. In John chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus said, But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, we know the spirit means, the water there means the spirit, right? So Jesus is saying to us that he's going to give us this wellspring of water, this gift of the Holy Spirit inside of us that will spring forth unto everlasting life. And when I think of the spirit, I think of joy one of the attributes of the Spirit, right? Because that joy from within, it comes from the Holy Spirit, and he gives it to us. Jesus gives it to us as a gift. The difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is a feeling or an emotion, but joy is a conviction, an attitude that you can choose. Happiness happens, but joy abides. Happiness happens, but joy abides. I follow sports, and maybe my team wins, and then I'm happy, but when my team loses, I'm sad. When the weather is nice, I'm happy, but when the weather is bad, I'm sad. When I'm persecuted, when I'm put in jail, when any other bad thing happens to me, when I lose a a loved one to death, or someone gets an illness, I'm, I'm instantly sad. But through all those times, I can remain joyful. God commands us to be joyful. And when you think about the word joy, or in the Bible, when you do the word rejoice, right? Rejoicing is simply displaying your joy. 
we are commanded, and if you do a Bible search for the word rejoice, how many times it's written in the, in the Bible, you won't be able to follow them all. In fact, for me to prepare for this sermon just on the word joy alone, I had to condense because there's so much scripture on the word joy and how important it is. Joy, the kind of happiness that doesn't depend on what happens. Joy is the kind of happiness that doesn't depend on what happens. Joy is not a season, it's a way of living. You know, you oftentimes hear that about people, you know, in the winter time that, that they're, you know, and I think there's some science behind it with regards to our serotonin and melatonin levels and the vitamin D from the sun and us being happy, but you can still be joyful. You might not be happy, but you can still be joyful, and I need you to get that point. We are commanded to be joyful. Philippians 4 verse 4, Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord, how often? Always. And again he repeats it, I say rejoice. When you come into the house of the Lord, do you come to rejoice? To give praise to the Lord for everything that he's done for you throughout the week? You know, and, and not to say this to be critical because I'm, like I said, I'm guilty of it. Because sometimes we can walk through those doors and we, look, we have a look on our face like we just sucked on a lemon. <laughs> right? And I, I, I get that because sometimes during the week, you know, we get, we get bombarded with so much stuff during the week. You know, we, we, we get stresses, we get, um, you know, problems, family problems, work problems, uh, you, you name it. The list just goes on and on and on, right? And oftentimes we come here into the house of the Lord amongst other Christians or when we go out into the streets, when we go out to the byways, when we're at school, when we're at work, when we're in our homes, we do God this service by having that look that we just sucked on a lemon. Smile. Have some joy, inner joy that can't be stolen from you. He commands us, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know when, when he wrote that? He was in the Philippian jail. He was in the jail when he wrote that. Now, we, we, we're going we're gonna to go into when, what Jesus talks about joy. Now, we, we want to talk about any example in the Bible with regards to that joy that we're talking about, that biblical joy, not the happiness that the world teaches, right? Because happiness is fleeting. I'm happy when things go good, but then I'm sad or I'm angry or mad when things don't go well. Listen to this quote from the book, uh, it was a devotion called Our High Calling. We as Christians are not required to go about with long faces, sighing as though we had no savior and no hope. This will not glorify God. He desires us to be cheerful. He desires us to be filled with praises to his name. He desires us to carry light in our countenances and joy in our hearts. We have a hope that is far above any pleasures that the world can give, and this fact should be made manifest. We have a hope, a hope in the resurrection, a hope in eternal life, a hope in what Jesus' sacrifice meant to us. Why do we walk around with long, sad faces? Why should not our joy be full, lacking nothing? We have an assurance that Jesus is our Savior and that we may draw freely from him, we may partake freely of the rich provision that he has made for us in his word. We take him at his word, believe on him, and know that he will give us grace and power to do just as he bids us. We may constantly seek the joy of his presence. We need not be all the time upon our knees in prayer, but we may be constantly asking for his grace. Even when we are walking on the streets or we, we are engaged in our ordinary daily duties, we may constantly keep the mind ascending to Christ, and he will freely impart to us of his grace. Each and every day. When was the last time you prayed for joy? Think about it. You know, but we pray for the Holy Spirit, but we say part of, the, of, of that gift of the Holy Spirit, part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is that joy. Give me joy, God. Give me joy. Where can we get more sources? How can we tap into that source of joy? The joy of Christ is a pure, unalloyed cheerfulness. It is not a cheap gaiety that leads to vanity or words of lightness of conduct. No, we are to have his joy, and his greatest joy was to see men obeying the truth. When Jesus came into this world, the joy that he had was to do the Father's will. Did he not say that? My joy is to do the will of my Father. 
and our joy should be the same. Plead with God, saying, I make an entire surrender. I give myself away to thee. Then be joyful. The word is in you, purifying and cleansing your character. God does not want his children to go about with anxiety and sorrow expressed in their faces. He wants the lovely expression of his countenance to be revealed in every one of us who are partakers of the divine nature, for we have power to escape the corruptions of the world. We are not, because Christ died, left a company of orphans. It is possible for us to obtain victory after victory and be the most happy people on the face of the earth. Who should be the happiest people on the face of the earth? Should be us. Should be us. You know, the command says that to not bear false witness against your neighbor, but we bear false witness against God. When we walk around with long, sad, um, uh, uncheerful countenances, we misrepresent God's character, do we not? I love this quote. It was from a Christian evangelist. If you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. If you have no joy, there's a leak somewhere. We've got to top up that leak. Why is that joy leaking away from you? Joy cannot be manufactured or created. It is a gift directly from God. Joy has nothing to do with your circumstances. What's the difference between joy and happiness? Joy wells up and moves you from within. It is as present as the air. Happiness happens to you from external stimulus. It comes and goes like the weather. This quote from Rhonda Byrne, an Australian author, you are free to think thoughts of worry or joy. And whatever you choose will attract the same kind back. Worry attracts worry. Joy attracts joy. You get that? We talk gloom, we sing gloom, we walk around like we're gloomy. But if we talk about joy, if we think about joy, if we pray about joy, then joy will be manifest in our lives. Amen? You get that? It's very simple, really not complicated. Where does this joy come from? Galatians 2, um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, remember when I told you oftentimes when you see a list in the Bible, they are oftentimes listed in the order of their importance? Not always, but not 100% of the time, but usually that's generally the, the way things are written in the Bible. The fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit is listed there as what? Love. love. Now, love is supreme. No, that's the, he, love is the unbridled champion when we talk about the Bible, right? We know God is love. The Bible makes it pointedly clear. If you were to summarize the Ten Commandments into one word, it would be love, right? But right next to it, right after love, is joy. We know about love, but we oftentimes forget about joy. Joy and love, someone wrote, are inseparable twins. Think about it. If you love something genuinely, isn't joy going to follow? If you feel loved or give love, isn't joy going to follow? They go hand in hand. They're inseparable. Wherever one is, the other will be found. You want more joy in your life? Get more love. Give more love. How can you do that? How can we give more love? How can we get more love? How can we get more joy in our lives? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's as simple as that. When you think about the ministry of Jesus, right? We think of his ministry as being of joy, of saving sinners. But have you, have you thought of his ministry as a ministry of joy? A ministry of joy? Hear me out. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now, you talk about the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news, right? 
Jesus' ministry was one of joy. He came to this earth to impart joy to this world because now a Savior has come. The angel announced it to the, to the shepherds and the thing. But when you look at Matthew, you find the same thing. Luke 2.10, and then you compare Matthew 2.10, the same, the same chapter verse. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The heralding, the, no, the knowledge that Jesus was coming to this earth brought so much joy, the angels heralded it, that his ministry was going to be a ministry of joy. Joy is a byproduct of obedience. Joy is a byproduct of obedience. Turn with me in your Bibles to our scripture reading, John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 9 to 11. And we're going to stay in John because I'm going to give you some Bible verses. John, the Gospel of John is one of my favorite gospel. I, I love, love the way he writes his gospel because he intermingles that joy and that love throughout his entire uh, gospel. John chapter 15, beginning at verse 9. And it reads, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Do you want the love of Jesus? Do you want the love of God? Do you see the analogy there? He, he makes the, 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 the transition there to say, as I also have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, so then we see obedience brings love, right? Love brings obedience. And then right after that, follows joy. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his, lo in his love. These things, now what is he saying now, now in, in, verse, in chapter 15? If you study the gospel of John, if you go back to John chapter 14 and John chapter 13, right? John chapter 13, he had just washed his disciples' feet. Jesus is now starting to fall under the condemnation of sin. He's beginning to feel the separation from his father, but he knows he has to teach his disciples valuable lessons. He washes their feet to teach them humility. And then he talks to them. The last thing he said to them was about the vine and the branches. Except you abide in me, he says to them, you can bear no fruit. After he says those things in, in, John, in the earlier part of John chapter 15, he then says, these things have I spoken to you. Why did he tell them about the, the vine and the branches? He says, I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. Fullness of joy. Now, understand now, Jesus is about to be crucified and there, there's joy there. He says that my joy may be in you. Can you imagine you knew you were, you, let's just say you were on death row and you had a day to live. Would you be talking about joy? But here is Jesus telling his disciples, I want my joy to remain in you and I want your joy to be full. Skip down a few verses. Go to John chapter 15, verse 23. John chapter 15, verse 23. Now, whenever Jesus repeats something, whenever something is repeated in the Bible, and it's repeated three times, there's a reason for that, right? John chapter 15, verse 23 and 24. Jesus says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus is telling them, keep my commandments, render obedience, you will abide in my love, and then the joy will follow. So how do you want more, do you want more joy in your life? Abide in the Father's love. Obey his commandments. The love will be there, and then you're, gonna you're going to obey him out of the love that you have for the Father. And then the joy will follow. Skip now down to John chapter 16. Again, this is Jesus leading up to the cross, going into the Garden of Gethsemane. He is now discussing with his disciples the plans that he has for them. John chapter 16, verse 22. 22, 23, and 24. 
There in, in verse 22 of John chapter 16, it says, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that what? That your joy may be full. Ask the Father in Jesus' name so that your joy may be full. Why is it important to pray in Jesus' name? There's, there you have it right there. Three times Jesus is saying he wants your joy to be full. In John chapter 17, verse 13, he also says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, you know, you, when you study the book, the Gospel of John, and you talked about John chapter 17, this is Jesus' prayer for his disciples. He prays for the love. He prays for them to be one. And then he also prays that my joy may be fulfilled in them. It was not alone for those disciples. That prayer was for us as well. Jesus wants your joy to be full. Think of it as a glass of water where the water is just to the rim, that any little tap of the water would make the water spill out. That's how much joy Jesus wants to give you. Have you ever experienced it? If you are a Christian and you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. Find that leak and fix it. Can someone read for me Acts chapter 13, verse 40 now? Now, when Jesus prayed for them that their joy would be full, was that prayer ever fulfilled? Was that prophecy ever fulfilled? Turn with me to Acts chapter 13, verse 49. Can someone read Acts chapter 13, verses 49 to 52? Was the disciples, was Jesus' prayer that their joy may be full, was it fulfilled? We have a mic first, a volunteer to read. Acts chapter 13, verses 49, 50, 51, and 52. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable honorable woman and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Do you see that? They were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost because the word of God had now been starting to spread. That same joy is available to us. All we need to do is tap into the source, the Holy Spirit. Now, how did Jesus, how was he able to endure what he endured? As he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he was falling under the condemnation of sin, as he was starting to feel separation from the Father, how was he able to go through that? Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now, Paul endured persecution. He endured uh, imprisonment, but yet still had his joy. Peter, the same thing. All of the disciples, all of the martyrs, they all enjoyed that joy, that deep down joy that no one could take from them, despite the circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that when bad things happen, you can't have sorrow. You know, the Bible says that there's a time for everything. There's a season for everything, right? There's a time to weep. There's a time to mourn but we should rejoice, have that inner joy throughout it all. And they had it. They had it. We talk about this inner joy, this this peace that comes from God. Psalm 1611. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. 
At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. They, they, they were telling this story, this woman, she had uh, seven children, and she went down to visit some relatives uh, down in Delaware. And she had seven children, and five of her boys, uh, she noticed, were playing in the backyard. And they were all gathered and huddled, huddled together, and they seemed to be very happy, and they seemed to be very joy enthralled into whatever they were doing. So the mother, not wanting to disturb them, kind of quietly walks up to them to see what they're up to. And in the middle of the circle of the boys were five skunks, and they were playing with the skunks. And so the mother, not knowing what to do and panicked, she said, boys, run. And so each boy grabbed one of the skunks and ran. <laughs> you see, sometimes we lose sight of, the, I don't know if it's something within us as, as we get older, we seem to be less joyous. You know, you see a child and the joy that they have in the simplest of things. They find joy in the simplest of things. I remember it. I remember it. Why is joy so important and what is the purpose of this message that why I wanted to bring this for you? Because we're going to need it. You catch what I'm saying? We're going to need it. Persecution is coming. It's not far. Not far. You're going to need the joy. The joy of the Lord, the joy that, that that verse is talking about. In God's presence is fullness of joy. Luke chapter 6, verse 23 and 22. Um, sorry, 23, 22 and 23. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. What does he say in verse 23? Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Rejoice and leap for joy after they've reviled you, cast your name as evil, and hated you and excluded you? For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. I'm wrapping up the message, it's short and sweet. The reason why we need the joy is to endure the persecution that is going to come. If you don't have that inner joy, that wellspring of water that Jesus was speaking about, that overflows from you, you're going to run into some trouble. Pray for joy. There's joy in heaven. Do you know that? When is there joy in heaven? One sinner that repents. It says, Jesus said, in the presence of the angels, there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Can you imagine a thousand in one day? When the, second, when the, when the, when the, uh, the latter rain falls and the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure, and thousands are going to be converted in one day, can you imagine the joy in heaven? Ooh, I, I want to be there. There was a third century martyr he was anticipating death. He penned these last words to a friend. The quote didn't even say who, what his name was. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. Do you want joy in your life, my brothers and sisters? Do you lack joy? I do. Stand with me as I offer a prayer. I want to pray for you to have joy in your life. Bow your heads. Our loving Father, we thank you for the message, Lord. We know the importance of this joy, this joy that no one can take from us, the joy that is in your presence, 
the joy that you want to give us and you want to pour out without measure. Send your Holy Spirit to each and every person here today, Lord. I pray that as this message has touched hearts, whether it be here or online, I pray, Father, that you'll bring joy into the households, that you'll bring joy into the hearts, that it would overflow, and that no one here, Lord, would take on the name of Christian and be a sad person. I pray, Father, that you bless them abundantly. Give that measure of joy that, that's spoken of. You've promised to give it to us, Lord, and we hold that promise to be sure. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing as we do our closing hymn, Joy, 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 There'll Be Joy By and By. church is a place where we can be joyful and if you're not joyful that means you're missing on certain things that are happening in church on that note I would like to all let you know that moment of happiness and joy are also present in our AY program if you guys want to have some joy and full moments do join our AY program next week and we also have a quiz from Revelation 13 and 14 if you guys want to have a moment of happiness and joy with your own fellow members at church so let's pray Loving Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful message you've given us, Lord. Fill our hearts with joy, Lord, because that we need, we need it most, Lord, in this present moment. Make us appreciate each and every moment in our lives and make it joyful for, the, for ourselves and also to the ones around us, Lord. And also, Lord, make us to bring more souls to you, Lord, so that we may be joyful when they come to you. And heavens can be joyful about what we do through your help, Lord. We thank you, Lord, as we go back home. I ask your presence and your guardian angels to be with us and take care of us safely, Lord. We ask all this in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The deacons will usher you out.